This video is continuing onward right where the previous video left off. We're in part 090, numerical methods. Link to that document, as with all the videos and all the documents, is in the video description. The code in this video, just like the previous three videos, relies on you having the symbolics package in MATLAB, which does not come with the cheapest version of MATLAB, so you might not have it. Octave users can run this code, but you will need to download and run the symbolic package in Octave. There's instructions for how to do that on a video three videos back, and there's also some information about that in this video description. Now, my class used to be based on MATLAB for Engineers 5th edition, so the comment right here referring to chapter 13 is referring to chapter 13 in MATLAB for Engineers 5th edition. In the previous video, we took derivatives using MATLAB. In this video, we're going to take antiderivatives. So I just ran this section. I started off with declaring a symbolic variable just named x, and then I set into a variable named y a symbolic expression, x cubed plus sine of x, and then I simply say int parentheses y to take the antiderivative of this symbolic expression. And you can see my results in the command window. The antiderivative of x cubed is 1 quarter x to the fourth. Now it's displaying the 1 quarter as 0.25, but that's just fine. Antiderivative of sine of x is negative cosine of x. And what I think is pretty neat is that then we can take that result, that antiderivative, plug it back into the diff function and get right back to the original because diff is going to take the derivative, int is going to take the antiderivative. I will use the, word, the term integral uh, sometimes in this video, and I realize that integral and antiderivative are slightly different things, but uh, I'm just, you know, accidentally going to use them interchangeably a few times here, probably. Now, one way in which the derivative and the antiderivative are not exactly inverses involves the constant term, right? It's almost a joke in calculus class that your teacher is always trying to tell you, don't forget the plus C when you take the antiderivative. MATLAB does not include the plus C for you, and I think for very good reason, because what if you happen to be using a variable that uses the letter C? Well, that would be confusing if MATLAB is then inserting some other variable to represent a constant. Now, you could insert the plus C yourself. Here I do so just by declaring a symbolic variable named C and then adding the plus C to my antiderivative. And when I take the derivative, the C is treated as constant with respect to the variable of integration, so it's treated like a constant, and it just uh, disappears because the derivative of a constant is zero. What if there's more than one variable? Well, the int function, just like the diff function, can be told what variable you're taking the antiderivative with respect to. So the default is x, or if there's only one variable in the expression, it'll be that variable. And here we see antiderivative of our expression by default is with respect to x. So the sine of t and the plus 2 get treated as a constant. So in the antiderivative, sine of t plus 2 is in parentheses multiplied by x because a constant times x, the derivative of that is just the constant. And instead, if we would like to take the antiderivative with respect to t, as here I have an expression involving x and t, I simply say int parentheses y comma t. So your second input to the int function is the variable that you're taking the antiderivative with respect to. Why did MATLAB not group up the x cubed and 2 when those were being treated as constant, but it did group up the sine of t and the plus 2 when those were treated as constant? I have no idea but we're gonna move on to a definite integral. So now we're gonna find the area under a curve. I'm gonna run this section here. So here's my curve that we're gonna find some area under. I create a vector of x values, and then I create a vector of y values, and then I plot those. No symbolics are being used yet. And then down below, I clear out that data, create a symbolic variable x, create the exact same symbolic expression as I used in the calculation on line 652, so 658, that's an expression, no evaluation is taking place. 652, that's a calculation. I'm only using numbers and I'm just running through the arithmetic. It's really important to understand this difference because the two lines of code look almost indistinguishable. The only difference is I use the dot caret on line 652, calculate that cubed, that exponent there. But this down here on 658 is a symbolic expression. It is saving into memory a mathematical expression. On line 652, it's actually performing the calculations and saving into memory a vector of numbers. We're going to find the area under the curve between x equals 2 and x equals 3, and it is super easy, barely an inconvenience. We just say int parentheses y 
comma, the lower bound of our area of integration, and then our upper bound of our area of integration. So comma two, comma three. Now I do get my result back as a symbolic, so I want to use my double function to convert it to a numeric value. And down below I do the exact same thing, but I'm gonna use simfun. And what I'm gonna do here is I'm gonna calculate that antiderivative with int. I'm gonna use simfun to convert it to a symbolic function, or something more like an anonymous function where I can plug in values, and then I plug into that antiderivative, the upper bound of integration minus plugging in the lower bound of integration, which is exactly how you do a definite integral. And then finally, there's actually a third way that I make the same calculation. Now, obviously the very first way I did this with the int function is probably the easiest, but there is one good reason why you might wanna use this MATLAB function, this third way of doing it here. And anyway, the MATLAB function, which is a stiff competitor for the I function for worst possible function name, takes as input our symbolic expression and converts it into an anonymous function. And then you use a whole nother function that I have not introduced before named integral on the anonymous function, comma, the lower bound two, comma, the upper bound three, or whatever you want your lower and upper bounds to be. Continuing on down, we have an example problem from the book MATLAB for Engineers, 5th edition. This problem is on page 476 of that book. And according to this problem, work equals the integral of pressure with respect to volume. Now this applies to like the pistons in an internal combustion engine. At least that's what they tell me. I'm not an expert in this area. So we're gonna set up a particular instance of this problem using the ideal gas law. And we're gonna calculate how much work, which is a technical, physics or engineering term, we're going to calculate how much work this piston can perform. We're declaring a whole bunch of symbolic variables, P for pressure, V for volume. I forget what most of the rest of these are. T is for temperature. V1 and V2 are going to be the lower and upper bounds of our area of integration for when we integrate onto the curve. We're going to use placeholders for them so that we can fill them in with different values later on. Ideal gas law is a variable that I'm using to hold the equation P times V equals N times R times T. And the first thing that I'm gonna do is I'm gonna use the solve function to solve that ideal gas law for the variable P. And I'm actually reusing the variable P set equal to that result. So P now contains the symbolic expression of the ideal gas law when it is solved for P. This example is really putting together all the things that we've learned in this symbolics expression, basically this and the previous three videos. I'll go ahead and actually run this section. Graph pops up, we'll get to that in a little bit. There's our ideal gas law at the top, and there it is solved for P. Scrolling on down a little bit here. We're going to integrate the expression that P equals with respect to V, and then comma V1, comma V2. We're going to substitute in the placeholders V1 and V2 for the lower and upper bounds of integration. So this is even a new thing that we haven't quite seen before, but it's perfectly fine to do. Integrating P with respect to V using V1 and V2 as the lower and upper bounds of integration respectively. And we put that whole result into W, a new variable. Now, W equals this big old piecewise expression right here. I have not and do not plan on covering piecewise expressions in MATLAB, but suffice to say, MATLAB has a way of representing a symbolic expression that is piecewise. And it's actually not that hard to read, right? This first part right here declares that the subsequent portion is relevant over V1 less than or equal to zero and zero less than or equal to V2. And then the next section for zero less than V1 or V2 less than zero. And then the uh, equation that is relevant or the expression, excuse me, that's relevant for that section. So if you're familiar with piecewise functions, you can probably make out what's going on on that line, but I'm not gonna get into the details. Now next, we're gonna actually calculate how much work was done by using a substitution, substituting into W, replacing N with one, R with 8.314, V1 replaced with one, V2 replaced with five, and temperature replaced with 300. So all the substitutions are happening in one call to the subs function. I'm using dot, dot, dot to move some of it down to the next line. And I put in some spacing to try and show you to try and line up vertically what is being replaced by what else. And at this point, all the variables or constant placeholders have been replaced with numeric values. I use the double function to convert it from symbolic to numeric. And then I go ahead and display it out. And so for this piston, it's gonna perform 4,000 joules of work. 
Now the book solution actually estimates the area under the curve using one giant triangle. And I think that's a little bit silly because it's very inaccurate. So I'm gonna actually introduce the traps function to use the trapezoid method for estimating area under a curve. Now we've just got the exact area, so we don't really need to do this, but I think it's a good thing to demonstrate so that you can see, well, what if you weren't able to integrate? What if you just had data? You didn't actually have a function. Now to set this up, I need to substitute back into P for N, R, and T, still leaving the V volume as a variable. I'm gonna use F plot right here over an interval from one to five, F plot will not work in octave. Maybe there is a replacement for it, but I'm not sure what it is. All the rest of this code, once you've got symbolic package set up in octave will work, but F plot will not. All right, so then I use simfun to basically create an anonymous function where V is the input variable. I create a vector of values from one to five and I plug in to this pressure anonymous function, those values one through five to apply the calculation, apply the symbolic expression on those values. I get another vector result, y's, and I go ahead and plot those out. And that's the red line that you're seeing right here, as opposed to the blue, which was generated from F plot. I did try or, well, not try very hard, but I tried to graph using the rectangle method of estimating area under a curve. It didn't look good and I couldn't figure out quite how to make it look good. But in any case, there's this function called traps with a Z, and it's short for trapezoid and it will use the trapezoid method of estimating area under a curve. You just give to it your vector of X values, your vector of Y values, and it will set up a bunch of trapezoids and add up the area within them. The trapezoid method is uh, useful and relatively easy because a trapezoid is basically just a triangle sitting on top of a rectangle, and it's relatively easy to add up those areas. So here is our estimated area from the trapezoid method, about 4,200, as opposed to the exact, which is 4,000. And honestly, I think those are pretty good, pretty close together. So traps is a function that you can use. Again, if you are not able to take the antiderivative or you otherwise just don't have access to the particular function that you want to know the area under it. If you've got data points, you can still estimate using traps with a Z. One last little section on this video, and this material that I'm gonna cover right here is supplementary if you're taking my class, but if you're just watching along on YouTube, this might be interesting to you. So we've seen how to take area under a curve, but what if one of your bounds of integration is infinity? So here I've got the curve one over X squared, and suppose I wanna find the area under the curve from one to infinity. MATLAB can do this, but it can't do it using the INT function. In order to do this, I have to set up whatever expression that I'm trying to graph the curve that I'm trying to find the area under, I set it up as an anonymous function, not as a symbolic. So that's what you're seeing on line 754. And then I use the integral function applied on my anonymous function over my bounds of integration. So you see fun is the name of my function, comma one, comma infinity. MATLAB has a representation of infinity in it, and it's just INF. Now MATLAB does some things that I don't approve of. For example, if you take one divided by zero, it actually gives you that INF value, which uh, I think it should be undefined in some manner, but that's what MATLAB chooses to do. And that's it, that's how you do it. So you gotta use an anonymous function and this integral function, but other than that, that's how you find area under a curve when one of your bounds of integration is infinity. The area under this curve from one to infinity is just one. And the rest of the code here is just me setting up the graph by the way, the title uh, with this LaTeX that I'm using doesn't actually work in Octave, um, but that's a very minor thing. It's just the title of the graph. You can eliminate that. But yeah, that's it. That wraps us up for this video. The next section of videos after the exercise will look at interpolation and then curve fitting.